Much superior material now. Yeah, the, the, the silicone stuff, the old gelatin, was reasonably all right, but it only lasted maybe four or five times, and then it, it, it was beginning to deteriorate. But the, the stuff we use now, I mean, it goes on more or less forever, you know. When you make something, you've got to keep it straight. If you let it get bent and then it goes dry, then you can't get it straight. And so everything that's made is put in here, uh, as for example there. And in the early days of plaster work, or ornamental plaster work, they used to make what was called a case mould. This is a case mould here. This is the case bit of it, and that's the mould bit of it. The original would either be carved in timber or modelled in clay. In this area, it was normal to make the things in clay rather than timber. Once they'd taken the first plaster copy and they were happy they, with the, the original, as it was called, the clay would just be fired, put back into the clay bin. It would never be fired up. So the, the way it was done was that if this is, for the sake of description, this is your um, timber carving, they built a wall around it, covered the whole thing in a layer of clay, poured on your liquid plaster Paris, once it's set, that's your case, lift this off, strip away the layer of clay and then that's the void that's then filled up with the moulding compound. Made holes in the top so that you can pour the moulding compound in and also this is quite a simple mould but for more complex ones it lets the air escape. Pour in your moulding compound, once it's set, lift the case off, lift off your moulding compound, lay it into the case and it helps to stop any deflection, holds it steady, poured in your liquid plaster Paris, basically the same idea as a jelly mould. The first type of moulding materials they used for these moulds was just molten wax. I mean, to all intents and purposes, it's the same as melting a candle and pouring it on. The obvious disadvantage is that once the wax goes cold, it goes solid, so you could only make something that would pull out of a mould if you've got something that's relatively three-dimensional or with what we call an undercut, then um, you couldn't get it out. So the early plaster work either tended to be relatively two-dimensional or made of such a shape that it would pull out of a mould. The breakthrough came with the introduction of gelatine. Now that's a bit of gelatine, but it's about 100 years old, so it's brick hard. But in its time, it was relatively yeah. rubbery and yes, flexible. Rubber. What I've been telling you up to now was um, casting primarily enrichments for putting into a cornice. The next bit is making the actual cornice itself. The first thing you've got to do is get the profile of the cornice that you're going to make. If it's a restoration then we'd either cut a bit of it down and you can draw around it or make what's called a squeeze where we oil the cornice, push up a lump of plaster Paris. Once it's set you can take it down. You've got a shapeless lump of plaster but it's got the profile of the cornice and again you can draw around it. The third way is if it was a new cornice an architect would just give you a piece of paper with a profile drawn on it. You've then got to make a running mould. This is a running mould here. You can see here there's the remains of the bit of paper which has got the profile on it. The, the paper is glued to a sheet of zinc and then we cut round the profile of the cornice that we're going to be making. That's then nailed onto a piece of timber which again is cut pretty much the profile but it's kept back just slightly so when you're using it it almost like, acts like a funnel and sort of squeezes the plaster up. Mounted on a slipper, given a handle and then that's what's known as a running mould. Now once you've got your running mould there's two ways you can make a cornice. You can either run it on a bench and then go and screw it up or you can make it in situ or in position. There's not a right or wrong way. Traditionally in this area it was more normal to make it in situ Probably in England it was slightly more common to make it on a bench, but it just came down to local preference. 
We're going back to days of horses and carts and dirt tracks. The chance of them making any lengths of cornish and transporting them very far and them arriving in one piece was a bit remote. So if you're doing it in situ, you've got no problems of transport or storage or anything else. See up here above your head, I've kind of laid out the different stages of running the corners. The first thing they had to put up are the thin strips of timber there, which were known as Scotch brackets, and that gave you something to build the cornice onto. So then nail up the cornice rod and then that's what the that's what the running moulding runs on and as you build up your layers of plaster you gradually produce the finished profile of the cornice if you disregard the crisscrosses there that's what we'd call a plain cornice the bit at the end has got one two three enrichments in it and they would be cast as i was explaining earlier well in the early days in the gelatine moulds there was a tradition in a family of people not necessarily doing plaster work but doing some of the building trades that you'll find that, that quite often that's the case that, you know or we used to have quite a few labourers and very often if they had any family and wanted to do they became a plasterer and they did quite well yeah. We've always had apprentices and up until this year um, we've always had one as I say the last apprentice just finished his time about a couple of year and a half, two years ago, but he just left earlier this year because he's away to Canada, so at the moment we haven't got any apprentices, um, not quite sure if we're going to take on any more at the moment or not, but um, it's unusual for us not to have an apprentice, I mean, all through my working life I've tended not to have an apprentice. My great grandfather that started the company, he had come down to work in one or two jobs in Peebles and the surrounding area and after or while he was working here he met somebody in Peebles and decided to set up on his own in Peebles and we've been here ever since and after him it was my grandfather and then dad and now me um, after that not very sure but <laughs> we'll see one of the jobs that my great grandfather did while he was still working for another company was at a house called Portmore House in Edelston, which is about five miles north of Peebles. He did the job in 1884, and in 1980, so almost exactly 100 years later, 96 years later, they found a cigarette tin behind the cornice, and inside the cigarette tin was a note from my great-grandfather, and it said... Portmore House, Edelston, May the 1st, 1884. I write this so that it, that if ever it is found in after years, it may let the finder know how long it is since the corridor ceiling and frieze was put up and by whom it was done and how long it took for to do it. The master's name was James Annan Plasterer, who has a shop in Edinburgh, Perth and London. Men's names that done the ceiling and frieze Leonard Grandison, native of Preston Pan, Paddingtonshire, William Hunter, native of Hoyt, James McKillard, apprentice, native of Edinburgh. Time taken, each one, 297 hours, and the money was at the rate of six and a half pence an hour in Edinburgh, and here the same. Hoping that this will be picked up someday, yours truly, Leonard Grandison, foreman plasterer. And as I say, that was well, my great-grandfather, mm. his dad's grandfather. That was in 1884, and in 1886 he started up on his own, so it was just before he started up on his own. These are a couple of books that were done by my great-grandfather. Um, they are sketches and drawings of various cornices which and ceilings, etc., which he has done or did when they first started. Most of them have got numbers at the top and there's a, an index at the back to see where they're from. And um, they're obviously hand-drawn by him of various ceilings, primarily in Scotland and roundabout. And these are profiles of cornices that they've made for places. And the, these are um, ornaments that go in the cornice. The book's beginning to disintegrate slightly, but it's been opened and shut that often. <laughs>